Welcome back to the channel guys. Um, <clears throat> we're doing a backyard uh, little question period today. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, you guys know who I am, so why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Cheryl Sullivan and I'm a packaging consultant, very involved with the packaging industry and uh, very interested in the findings of these dives from a packaging perspective, because as you know, there is a lot of concern around uh, packaging in the environment. So contacted Henry and today we're just going to talk about what he's found on his dives and how this all got started. And yeah, it's actually very interesting he reached out uh, after uh, one of our last dives. Um, recently in the last couple months I've just been seeing all over the news the the, um, the Canadian government uh, whether it's at the provincial level or at the federal level uh, a lot of talk about one um, one time use plastic packaging uh, there is um, a very active move on banning of um, single-use stuff uh, everything from plastic bags to cutlery takeout containers so and that's just what I'm aware of as a consumer and obviously you're the expert in this right so you reached out to me and I said okay well why don't we sit down and have a chat apologize um, it's it's starting to rain of course it was sunny and then it was raining then it was sunny so we're trying to get this done quickly here but uh, if you see us blinking that's because of the rain here so anyways um, why don't we start with some of the questions you may have and I'll, I'll share what I can right so I understand you've done well over 80 cleanups and I just wondered when this got started how it got started and what your findings have been so share with that with us first. right yeah so I started um, cleanup dives when uh, I sold my scuba diving shop in 2013 and one of my buddies said hey do you want to go dive in a lake and I said yeah sure let's do that and uh, I've never dove in a lake before uh, went out and had a dive and found uh, just a massive trough of garbage um, with some of that kind of stuff in front of us this is a small sample um, cans, bottle, beer bottles, that kind of stuff, and so we, we took some with us. We had no way of carrying things, so we were kind of struggling to hang out the cans and bottles. Uh, went back, went back again, brought more divers, brought more equipment, and we just haven't stopped. So we're up to our 86 dive uh, just the other day in Whistler. Um, took a 400 pounds there. We're up to about 27,000, over 27,000 pounds, almost 28,000 pounds of garbage in the last six years. So since the end of 2013 until now. Uh, so it's been um, an ongoing process. We clean as much as we can. Is this primarily lakes that you're doing these clean up in? Or I, I think I saw you were doing a little bit in the ocean as well. Yeah, yeah. So we um, we try to hit uh, areas where there's just tremendous amount of garbage. So, and of course, as, it, as things turn out, uh, it's the party spots, right? So where kids go and um, party, whether it's is during grad season or just the summertime um, so if kids are sitting in a particular spot where there's a rope swing or maybe a cliff jumping area or maybe just a sunny spot on a rock um, that's where we're finding the tremendous amount of garbage so we do go into the ocean but predominantly it's where people have been dumping things okay. so for example uh, we've known where there's been derelict boats sitting just offshore in a in a cove and we'll go there and we'll find a, a tremendous amount of garbage um, but a lot of times the contamination is quite different um, and also there's a lot of marine life that live in the cans and bottles and so on. So sometimes when we disturb their habitat is really unfortunate because they now live in the beer bottle and beer can. So we find that just with the clean, with, with, with the lakes, it has, it just worked out better so far mm -hmm. for us in the sense of removing things. There's rarely anything living in them. Sometimes there's a sculpin, but not not very often so yeah a lot of lakes less ocean for sure okay so you mentioned the war on plastics and particularly single-use plastics and of course my background packaging I'm curious as to if you've seen any trends in what and packaging waste so obviously these cups because these are probably what people are drinking their drinks in <coughs> what else have you seen bags have you seen straws have you seen any other yeah, so the first the problem with um, with the lighter things such as a straw or, or, or a plastic bag is that they, they tend to get blown or they float very well, mm -hmm. so they're floatsome versus jetsome. Um, so we find it difficult to to say definitively, say, well, there's no straws here, therefore there's nobody throwing straws into the lake. Well, that may not be the case, right. just that the straws are so much lighter, the wind will take it and it blows it over there somewhere, whereas we're picking up things that have sank directly below the party spot. Um, so we we simply cannot say, well, nobody's using straws in the backcountry because we can't find any straws, right? Um, but that just simply means that the, the, the beer can and beer bottle sank directly where somebody threw it or dropped it. 
Um, we have found, um, like you say here, there's, uh, you see some solo cups here. Um, we also see um, some plastic takeout containers, not the styrofoam ones, just simply because again, they're lighter, they get blown away. Yeah. Um, and so they end up over there somewhere. Uh, so let's say you and I were sitting on a rock having a picnic and the wind caught the styrofoam packaging. Yeah, it's not going to go right where we're cleaning, where our beer bottle fell in. Right. Um, it got blown, you know, two, three hundred meters away. So right. it's much harder for us to get. We may not even know it's there. Yeah, or it might go to the shore. Exactly, yeah. it, and it's sitting at the surface. And we certainly have found that where um, a plastic container with a cap on, yep. it's uh, it's airtight, right. uh, so it'll float. And so we'll actually get over, and we're literally at the surface as a right. diver, right. and we're reaching into the bush trying to pull something out. So we right. see that as well too. Yeah. Okay, all right, good. And And through all of this, you've come up with all of this. What is the most common uh, foreign material you see on your dives? Would it be what we're seeing today, cans? Well, definitely beer cans and beer bottles are the biggest thing. And funny you should ask that. We, uh, through our experience in our 80-something dives, uh, we've actually learned um, uh, trends as far as individual sites. So for example, if somebody is uh, going from a shore access beach, mm -hmm. uh, let's say for example at Lost Lake, mm -hmm. um, the, the party people or the people who are just sunbathing what they have to do is they have to swim with a couple of beers in their hand over to the swim dock um. and then they drink their beer on the swim dock now whether they just throw the beer can over the edge of the dock okay. or the wind catches it and takes it down i'm finding all of this directly underneath the dock okay so people are less likely to swim with a glass beer bottle than they are with a tin beer can because first of all you don't need a bottle opener you can just pop right, a tap right. so at a place like Lost Lake in Whistler we're finding beer cans specifically okay right? um, whereas if it's a place where somebody uh, like so let's say Bunsen Lake in Port Moody yes so there's a there's a rope swing clip jumping area off to the side yeah. and people don't swim there they actually take a little floaty and they float there so on the float, they can carry more things. Right. So there we'll see glass bottles, okay. way more of it okay. than we would see tin cans, right? I see. Um, because it's easier for them to transport, right? right? So, um, and then uh, cliff jumping areas, we'll see things like a uh, single shoe, because as they jump off, they right. lost their shoe, right. they lost. Uh, so we'll see a lot of um, things that kind of fall out of their pockets, right? Um, so each individual area, every lake that we found garbage in, it almost has its own flavor in okay. the sense of what okay. what happens there, right. Right? what the activity is. Right. Right? So right. for oh, for so for example, in Brom Lake, just off of Squamish, there, uh, I found four GoPros in one dive, right, and because it was right underneath the cliff jumping area, and uh, and that's where the people were jumping with the GoPros in their hand, and we recovered four GoPros in one dive. Right. So the flavor of the lake, really. Okay, and then I saw on your last post a lot of golf balls yeah so um, there's uh, uh, so Lost Lake is situated right next to a golf course mm -hmm. so I'm not really sure how those golf balls are getting in there I don't know if people are just whacking them off the beach because I'm finding mine like right next to the swim grid uh, the half the golf balls came from Alta Lake and apparently according to some of the locos that the guys that have their um, what would be called party barges so part of their dock actually detaches and they'll put a little motor on it and they motor around some of them will actually set up an actual golf platform and they just whack golf balls into the lake so and my frustration with that is that the golf ball i mean it's it's uh, it's plastic on the outside and the rubber bands on the inside right. um, and that's got to take just a massive amount of time to yeah. decompose yeah. and then when it does slowly decompose uh it doesn't come not that this is any better but it doesn't break down into small uh, chunk smaller chunks right, of plastic right. it, it, it actually just leaches yeah right so yep. now this is compounds that are at a molecular level and arguably it will uh, evaporate with the water it goes up into your atmosphere and then yes. it moves elsewhere and then it comes down in the form of rain taking taking uh, or bringing down chemicals that isn't really there mm -hmm. and there's no way you can even, it's not a plastic particle like you can't see it Right. right it's leaching so I and mean, that's to me is just so frustrating it right. is frustrating you know it's like that it's a garbage dump and that's not the way it should be but 
I had another question for you. You mentioned you did, uh, you started these dives quite a while ago and you kept some statistics from way back when. Right, yeah. So yeah. This, this was definitely a frustrating part when this happened. So when we first started, um, I still had, uh, this was right at the tail end of me uh, when I still owned the dive shop. Mm -hmm. And we worked with Project Aware. Um, mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. believe their website is projectaware.org. Um, and they work with um, the Patty agency and mm -hmm. what they do is they kept track of all of the garbage that people, all the divers collected. Right. So then we would fill up a massive questionnaire online and then, um, and typically what would happen is people would, uh, would organize dive shops, would organize one dive per year. So for a typical dive shop, it wasn't such a big deal because they would simply um, do this one time once every 12 months right so we were doing this like once every week once every two weeks right so we would accumulate 400 500 pounds of garbage right. and it would take us a couple of hours to right. actually take down the information we have to count the individual cans how many golf balls how many cell phones how many pairs of sunglasses little bits of plastic and it's a big big ordeal right. um, so we were using the project aware just because everything was online it's really simple so what we would do is we would we would tally it mm -hmm. on a piece of paper mm -hmm. and then we sit down in front of a computer and then uploaded all of the information to right. project aware right what happened was they changed the platform and they lost all of the data right so we were using it so we never recorded the data on a separate spreadsheet right. because with so much data it was completely pointless for us as far as time right. management, right. to enter everything on a spreadsheet and then enter the same thing onto a database at Project Aware. So we just put all of our eggs in one basket and use Project Aware as our database. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, so they went to a fancy system. They kind of went with um, uh, just an older website look yep. to a brand new, um, very social media savvy, yep. you know, high tech website. But in doing so, they, they lost all of our data and we had no way of retrieving them to then I think they didn't really care because they already in the in their background they already accumulated all the numbers that they need as a whole yeah but we needed the numbers in case somebody ever came to me and said how many beer bottles right right so we can go back and look at the individual dive and say we took out 1700 beer bottles at this lake right that was our only way of doing that so okay. when they took the old system offline we had no access to it at all. Are um, they still around, Project Aware? Uh, you know what? They must be because uh, it, it's a pretty big organization, um, and they're part of Patty uh, Canada, right. or, or sorry, Patty as a whole. Right. Um, and uh, I, I can't imagine that. I, I haven't looked at their website, but I can't imagine that they're they're not there. Well, um, I think it would be worthwhile for me to go in and check with them and see if they have some yeah, statistics because, that would really help yeah, us. Yeah, because their their data is literally um, when we upload, it's pages and pages, and right. it breaks down into everything into tiny pieces of plastic to uh, batteries to cell phones to pieces of clothing right. uh, what kind of clothing is it is a wool is it you know it was, it was very detailed so therefore it took us a long time right. to input this so uh, hence the frustration once once they lost all of the data we just threw our hands up in the air and said you know what this is and we were only doing it for that website no one came to us and never asked us how many beer bottles right. how many beer cans Right. And really, today, even today, nobody really knows except for my social media, uh, social media uploads. Uh, so unless somebody either from a government or from a, an, an NGO came over and asked and said, hey, listen, we're curious, what did you pull out? Right. Um, then we could tell them. So what we do now is we simply just keep track of total weight, just for the sake of, hey, how many, how many pounds have we pulled out so far? So we, we do do that um, just for the sake of um, sort of a big number knowledge. Right. right. And you have that by, by location? That's right. Yeah, by location, by date. By date and, and total uh, pounds. Yeah, yeah. Out. I mean, we can, for example, I can probably just go back as I do record it. Uh, it's easy enough just to go 400 pounds from Lost Lake. Or also what I can do is I can just go back and add the previous years and give you a total number right, over the right. last say 10 years we've been at it for six years but if if um, if somebody were to ask say 10 years later yeah. yeah I just have to go back and quickly add a couple of numbers that wouldn't okay. be hard to do at all okay yeah. good good to know so over 27,000 pounds yeah yeah of well, garbage yeah retrieved that's right in these that's dives. right yeah that's e yeah everything from car tires the biggest thing we ever pulled out was um, was a boat out of Kate's Park um, we pulled out um, 
Uh, I saw a toilet in one of the last yeah, videos. Yeah, yeah, a toilet, an RV toilet on the side of a like a rest stop. Yeah. Yeah. So, so obviously be... somebody either, which is really frustrating because there's there's a garbage right there. They could have just put it next to the garbage, but somebody felt it was necessary to throw it in the lake, which is really unfortunate. Right? So what's your message to everybody? Like just take your garbage out with you. I mean, I hike. I dive, I kayak, and the rule of thumb is take out what you take in. Yeah. That's the message. Well, take out more. <laughs> or take out more if, yeah, you, can, yeah, if right. you can, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think most of us do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's very frustrating. Um, and 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 to to qualify it, I do understand that. For example, Brom Lake is a really good example of this. So where the where the rocks, there's several rocky areas where people sunbathe and and um, have a few drinks and and whatever. It's not smooth. It's you know there's a slope and there's a doggy area. There's mm -hmm. like multiple dog areas. Um, you know like a kid runs by or if a dog runs by, knocks your beer over, or the wind catches it, and over the beer can goes right. Um, and I get that because we see that we see because we can see underwater if the rock above the water runs this way and then the sheer wall and then a lip sheer wall lip, lip. we can see the bottles and cans right at the edge here so we know that that's where it's sitting mm -hmm. um, so that's an accidental garbage situation mm -hmm. but when people are throwing things for example over a sas mat at mm -hmm. the floating docks mm -hmm. um, the beer cans and such are at a at an actual distance this is where people are actually hucking stuff 30 50 feet away the actual throwing distance so yeah i mean it's frustrating we try to you know it's really the education message that i do yeah. try to get out and which is why i do as much social media as i do mm -hmm. is it's like look spread the news you know mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. this stuff doesn't disappear mm -hmm. right one exactly. of my favorite sayings that i often and pose is I'll post up a picture beforehand of a beautiful lake and then I'll post a picture underneath the lake I said this is what you see this is what I see yeah right so and this is it when I go underwater this is exactly what I see and it's not yeah. nice no right? it's not so, no well you know what you're doing great work um, are you looking for volunteers or do you have enough volunteers so we do um, we do have a small crew of divers these are highly highly confident yeah. divers so um, almost all of the divers are either uh, cavers or technical divers okay. um, almost everyone has, has I'm pretty sure everyone has over a thousand dives mm -hmm. um, so we when we do get people reaching out to us and say hey can we volunteer and say you know what um, we're good right just because um, these dives are pretty challenging mm -hmm. um, but I do encourage people and say look you know what just do your own thing get involved in your own community whether it's just you're out for a walk and you pick up a coffee cup yeah. just literally in front of your own house because guess what that ends up in the ocean um, or if you do get involved with a bigger thing such as the great canadian shoreline cleanup yes. uh, there which is an annual event uh, or there's lots of other community-based uh, trail work uh, if you're up in the forest uh, you know things like that you can get involved in right, right. so right. Um, so we we don't take on fresh volunteers in our group okay right um, but for sure i mean there's everyone can do something in their own community right. right so lastly in the ocean you dive in the ocean as well yes yeah have you seen much in the ocean in the areas that you dive in or off boat diving so the problem with ocean diving is, and garbage is that often when we're diving with a charter they're taking us to a tourist diving area it's not that there's no garbage there but the, uh, the chances of us running into garbage patch is rare um, because if you let's say for example if I travel to Thailand or maybe Bahama the captain isn't gonna say hey listen I'm gonna take you to a garbage patch and put you into the water right, <laughs> right. Um, however having said that I have been in uh, diving situations where while we're in the water a storm came in and washed out a culvert that was uh, full of garbage on, on land so as we were in the water it just floats some of garbage right. floated right over us and it just it covered the daylight like literally we looked up and we couldn't surface because there was so much garbage going above us kind of like a log boom right? yeah. and and eventually we had to surface because the boat was right there and we came up and there was just everything from uh, pens to to plastic bags to take out 
garbage too. Yeah, like like anything, anything and everything that could float was was literally floating past us, and it was it was pretty disturbing. Where was that? Uh, that was in Bali, and I and and I can guarantee you, it doesn't have to be Bali. That you could substitute that country's name with almost any country. That right. that would happen, right? And yeah. guess that where that ends up? That'll just end up in one of the gyres, yeah. one of the garbage patches, exactly. right? So. Yeah. Well, this is great. So thank you for sharing this, and I think we really need to get the message out that we have to be aware of where our garbage is ending up. I have even lost sunglasses, so I understand that. I don't think anybody throws their cell phone away, but it's all of this other garbage that we do have control over that uh, we intentionally leave behind that we really want to address. So thank you very much. Oh, Appreciate thank you. Appreciate you spending the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad this yeah, worked out. It wasn't <laughs> All right. Okay, good. Thanks, everybody. Cheers.